I'm so glad to have Amanda, Andrea, Heather, and Julie with us today. So you are at Nuts and Bolts on Adult Career Pathway Credentials. So thank you so much for being here, everybody. And I'll turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, Patsy. Um, I'm Julie Dinko. I'm the Transition Specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education. And uh, thank you for joining us for the session this morning. Uh, it's going to be about three credentials that are being offered in the ABE system currently. Um, and just to uh, kind of kick us off, uh, we're, I'll review the objectives, which are to define the term credential, which uh, a lot of people interpret or have different interpretations of. So we're going to go through that a little bit. Then we're going to go and dig a, dig a little bit deeper into each of the credentials that are going that are offered by ABE programs um, throughout the state. And then we're hoping through this whole uh, session today that you're going to be able to articulate how ABE programming can support uh, the work of students earning credentials. So just to uh, start us off uh, defining the term uh, credential. So what I have listed here on this slide is actually our Federal Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act definition of a credential. And they actually term it recognized post-secondary credential. And uh, credential post-secondary just means, you know, it's after your high school diploma or it follows um, high school equivalency. And credential is a large umbrella term for um, many different types of certificates, certifi certifications, licenses, et cetera. And so post-secondary, it can refer to an industry recognized certificate or certification. And by far, this is the category where most ABE programs offer a credential is in the certificate or certification category. Um, a certificate of completion of an apprenticeship program also qualifies as a post-secondary credential. However, um, currently those are difficult for a lot of ABE learners to get into and complete. Uh, we're working on it though. And another one is a license recognized by the state involved or federal government. Um, so an example of that might be a boiler's license. So that is a state recognized license. Um, and that's one that is actually offered by ABE programs as well. And then finally, we have the associate, associate or bac uh, baccalaureate degree. And those are uh, not as common, you know, to, uh, obviously they're not offered within ABE, but what we do an incredible job doing is building on ramps, bridges, and transitioning learners into uh, college pathways that will end in an associate's degree or a baccalaureate degree. Um, but most ABE learners start off in the certificate credential area. So that's what we're going to highlight this morning. And we're going to start off with uh, Amanda Tall, who is doing paraeducator. So welcome, hello, hello. Amanda. <laughs> and am I? Oh, good. I'm unmuted. Okay. All right. So there I am. Welcome, everybody. And um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the introduction, Julie. Um, so again, I'm Amanda Tall, and I work for Moundsview Adult Education and Metro East Career Pathways. Um, my current role is the Career Certifications Instructor, um, and I am teaching the online statewide paraprofessional program, as well as a certified nursing assistant program in partnership with St. Paul College. All right. Okay, so I just wanted to start off by uh, defining what is a paraprofessional. Um, so a paraprofessional, or also sometimes called a teacher assistant, um, is responsible for providing hands-on support to a classroom or a special education teacher when preparing lessons or teaching students in the classrooms. So roles and titles are going to vary by district, um, but many schools employ what we would call either the instructional or the non-instructional paraprofessional. Um, so again, those roles and titles do vary uh, greatly. Um, so for example, some schools might say paraeducator, you might hear education support professional, uh, the ESP, 
um, education assistant, the EA, um, maybe an instructional aid, um, and there are many others. Um, but those um, instructional paras are working in the classroom with students um, on academics. Um, and so it's for um, these paraprofessionals that were really focused on those credentials. Um, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, and just to be clear, we're supporting um, both general education and special education classrooms. Um, now that non-instructional paraprofessional, um, in Mounds View, we say supervisory. Um, again, other districts might have a different title for that, um, but in that particular role, the paraprofessional would be um, not working in the classroom on academics with students, but more, say, in the lunchroom or at recess, maybe in the hallways or um, perhaps on field trips. Um, now, in the chat, there is a link to the Minnesota Department of Education requirements um, all about paraprofessionals, so I just wanted to draw your attention to that um, as I just going to quickly show you what it looks like. Um, but as I go through um, these materials, um, excuse me while I just make sure I navigate that. So I'll be referring to this. So you can see that in the chat if you would like to. Oh, excuse me. Okay. All right. So again, instructional versus that sort of non instructional. Okay. So again, thinking about the credentials, right, um, as Julie was mentioning, so the credentials or certificates that are approved in the state of Minnesota um, to work in the classroom as an instructional paraprofessional um, is going to require either the paraeducator, um, sometimes called the paraeducator online, um, which is um, given by the master teacher, that's the testing company, um, also the parapro, um, and you can read more about that on that link that um, was just shared in the chat. Um, and that is uh, ran by ETS. Um, and so I put together this document here, um, Minnesota Paraprofessional Requirements Plus Assessment Information. And I think it'll be helpful um, to kind of go through this um, as a group here as briefly as I can, um, because um, there was too many steps to put on one slide. And also because I think it's nice to have all the information in one place. Um, so let's see if I can make that a little bit bigger and hopefully um, everyone can see the screen okay. And I do apologize while I get all of these little tech pieces. Okay. All right. So Minnesota paraprofessional requirements and assessment information. Um, so there's that link right there. Um, Minnesota Department of Education, the one that's in the chat right now. Um, and it sort of talks about these requirements that you would find for those instructional paraprofessionals. So those that are working in the classroom. Um, and so for that, um, the state of Minnesota says that you need to have either two years of college credits. Usually that's gonna be 60 credits in Minnesota um, through an accredited institution or higher education. And then note it's or, um, an associate's degree or higher, or a passing score on um, one of these assessments that we'll talk about in just a moment. So it does not require that you have all three of those things, right? Um, just one um, at the minimum there. Um, and then please do note that non-instructional paraprofessionals, sometimes again called supervisory paras, um, you might hear me say affectionately para, um, sometimes that's the language we hear in schools, um, just short for paraprofessional of course. Um, those are required to have a high school diploma or a GED, um, but college credits or that paraprofessional assessment are not required for employment. Um, so just to be clear about those, that distinction there. Okay. So in order to earn your paraeducator, step one is to obtain your account. Um, so to obtain that account, you need to contact your local service cooperative. This link is um, in that uh, Department of Education link. That, again, that's in the chat that I um, sort of, uh, let's see, just so you can remember this one right here. Um, and so, oops, and I lost my page right there. Um, so you can go ahead and, and go to that link and it'll show you the state of Minnesota and give you various ways of contact uh, contacts that you can obtain your account that way. Um, or you can contact us um, to um, learn more about our online statewide paraprofessional class and we're happy to get you set up with an account as well. Um, and then after you have your account, um, super simple, you just set up your username and, and password. Um, and then you have 13 lesson modules and two practice tests to complete. Um, and so I've listed those here and they're divided into two topics. Um, well, really it's reading, writing and math topics, but that are broken up into two uh, sort of domains. 
Um, so the first is instructional support. Um, we think about this kind of like theory, um, sort of the theory of how to support a student in the classroom, um, whereas the knowledge and application part of the test is more um, what is the answer to the question, right? So for example, two plus two is four versus how to teach two plus two is four. Um, and again, reading, writing, and math. Um, these lessons are all self-paced, independent. Um, and once the student has successfully um, made it through that information, um, then they're welcome to schedule and take their assessment. So those are the number of questions and the passing scores. Um, everything is multiple choice. Um, I love that the practice test is very similar um, looking to the real test. Um, so students sort of have that um, going in. Um, they kind of can picture what they're getting into. Um, and the test is also untimed. Um, which is a really helpful thing, especially when we're um, dealing with test anxiety, um, as many of us do. Um, and also, you can earn your credential the same day that you pass the test. So you can literally walk out of the testing center with your credential in hand. Um, additionally, if you do not pass one or both of those tests on your test day, you do have the option of retesting kind of immediately. Um, I say kind of because it depends on you know, if you failed by quite a bit, we might talk and say, hey, it might be a good idea to go back and study before you continue on. Um, or maybe it's late at night and we're getting ready to close. So kind of depending on the circumstances, um, but there is that option there. Um, and then additionally, um, that account that you receive is good for a full year, um, which is really, really helpful because there's 170 lessons. And again, only 15 of them are meant for the test. So the rest of those lessons are all geared towards um, important topics that you're going to run into in the field. So behavior management, special education, you know, first day on the job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the account is going to continue to be useful even when we're out there practicing in the field. Um, now quickly about the para pro. Um, the first step, if you were going to take that test as your credential, um, you would need to contact ETS or your local district to determine the process. Um, that's changed a little bit in the past year. So certainly um, your first best bet would be to go to your local district or again, um, contact the testing center. Um, and then um, I always recommend, you don't have to, but um, it's a good idea to take a practice test first. Um, that's also linked in the materials um, that are available, uh, it says, in the participants materials folder. Um, so there's a practice test there if you'd like to take a look at that. Um, but of course, that helps us to determine what needs to be worked on um, in order to be successful. Uh, now, the passing score is 460 in Minnesota. Um, which doesn't really mean a lot um, if you haven't, you know, kind of compared to the other things, but just knowing that um, the Parapro is accepted in many states, um, as is the paraeducator online, um, and 460 is kind of on the higher end. So something to know that if your student is moving to another state, um, they would have to do some research to see if that state does accept the Parapro um, or the paraeducator online. Um, but that a 460 is a little more of a guarantee that it might be transferable to another state. Um, let's see, so the test has 90 questions, 15 of which do not count. Um, they're for data collection. Um, now this is a time test. Um, there is a language accommodation available for students who qualify. Um, I believe it adds like an extra hour and 15 or something like that. Um, and you can hide the clock. So again, for those anxiety, um, you know, that test anxiety, um, it can be nice to kind of not see how much time you have left. Um, now, in this case, if you don't pass, you have to wait three weeks to retest. Um, and then also the official credential takes about two weeks to arrive in the mail. Um, but unofficial score reports are available immediately after passing. Um, so in some cases, um, we have practicing paraprofessionals where the school is waiting for those um, scores in order for as a condition of employment, um, or perhaps to get a raise if someone is moving from instructional or excuse me, non instructional to instructional. Um, so in a case like that, um, the school might be waiting. And so um, it's nice that you can at least get that unofficial score report right away. And again, with the paraeducator, you're going to get the real certificate right away. Um, and you can have the report sent to your school. Now, the Parapro does not offer job training. So it is just a test. Um, so that's another detail about that test as well. Okay. 
So fixing my screen here. Um, so that information again is linked in the participant materials folder. Um, okay, so just a little bit more about the employment requirements. So we already kind of covered that a little bit, um, again, linked in the um, Department of Education um, information. Um, but to work in the classroom, so uh, general education, special education, um, any of those roles that we named before um, that are related to academics um, in the classroom, um, the, the para would need to have a high school diploma or equivalent. Um, again, one of those three requirements are covered. So the two years of credit, um, the degree, or that para educator or para pro. Um, and it's important to note that college credits can be from outside of the US. Um, and so um, at least in Moundsview, I don't wanna speak for other districts, of course, um, but in Moundsview, we have definitely hired um, para educators with degrees and more than 60 credits outside of the US. Um, and for us in Moundsview, we just say it needs to be written in English um, or if you can have it translated to English. So that's just an important caveat um, to note. Um, now, in the research that I've seen, um, kind of looking around the state, um, the typical pay for an instructional paraeducator would be between $19 and $24 per hour, again, varying by district, and certainly there may be other um, exceptions to that. So if anyone knows of somebody making less or more, um, I'd be happy to hear all about it, um, but that's based on what I've seen. Um, now. Um, comparatively, looking at the non-instructional, so again, sometimes called that supervisory, um, again, the high school diploma or equivalent would be required. Um, I mentioned the possessing and displaying excellent communication skills, of course. Um, you know, when you look at the job description, you'll see many other um, important um, bullet points there, um, but that's one I wanted to highlight. Um, but there's no license or certificate um, as far as that paraeducator or para pro um, needed there. Um, and then the typical pay, again, based on what I've seen, is roughly $16 to $19 per hour um, and varying by district. Okay, um, so just quickly about the bridge programming. Um, so to qualify for the online statewide class, um, the one that um, I'm teaching and that uses the paraeducator online, um, students need to have a 228 or higher on a CASA's goals reading test um, or equivalent. Um, currently, we do not offer bridge programming for prospective or practicing paraprofessionals, um, but what a wonderful idea. Um, so we definitely have a growth mindset about what is possible for that. Um, but for right now, um, anyone who hasn't quite gotten to that number yet, um, of course, we would you know, recommend other classes to help get them up to that level. Um, okay, and then I've kind of touched on this, but um, the changes that we've seen um, uh, recently that have impacted instruction um, or the course. Um, so last summer, um, Parapro, um, or I believe it was ETS, had like a business model change um, that impacted where tests could be delivered. And so the Parapro was no longer offered at the in-person um, Pearson View sites. Um, this is the way that I understand what happened. Um, but so since we were a Pearson View site, or we are a Pearson View site um, in Mounds View, um, we, um, we decided to switch over to the paraeducator. Um, so it, it was these five pro metric testing centers where it was going to be um, delivered and we didn't want to send our students to other locations and we didn't want them to take it online. So um, preferring our students to test in person, um, we decided to switch to the paraeducator, um, as I mentioned here. Um, however, the class itself has continued to have the same three objectives that it's always had. Um, test preparation if needed, right? So of course, some students do come with some college credits. Um, and I will mention sometimes they choose to still take the test even with those 60 plus credits, um, either as a refresher or just to kind of build confidence um, before working with students in those areas. Um, and then also the job training. So the, switching to the paraeducator online has been really helpful for that. Um, leading up to that, when I was teaching the Parapro, um, I was kind of um, working with other materials that were kind of from other locations. Um, I believe they were quality, but the paraeducator has been um, uh, more robust. Um, and then, of course, job search support as well. So, um, yeah, that is what I have on the paraeducator. Um, if anyone has questions, 
please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute. Uh, raise your hand. Let's see if I can see everybody here. Oh, and yep, Rita is saying the paraeducators are very nice. And yes, Rita, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I have been, I've had such a wonderful experience working with Master Teacher. Um, really friendly, um, really quick um, uh, answers. You know, they respond to emails and phone calls really, uh, really quickly. So I've had a good experience working with them. Does anybody have anything they would like to ask or share? And if not, I will turn it over to Andrea. I feel like I should say dun dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> that okay. is incredible, Amanda. Oh, thanks. really, really helpful. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Yes. Okay, good. Oh, and Carlin is chiming in too about great experience. Okay. So, Andrea, without further ado, I will mute myself and welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Hasslinger, and I am a teacher at Winona Adult basic education. I'm also the Southeast ABE distance learning coordinator. Um, I'm really new to, um, <clears throat> to the community interpreter program. I just finished teaching um, a bridge course for the um, 40 hour certificate and I'm planning on doing one this summer. Um, so I'm happy to give you my information um, to the best of my knowledge. If you wanna go to the next slide, Thank you. So um, in terms of what's approved in Minnesota, Minnesota is interesting because um, of course we want the most highly trained interpreters that we can have. However, you can be hired as an interpreter without training. Um, all you really have to do is put your name on the Minnesota roster. If you look in the middle, there's a state roster. Um, under medical interpreter, the State Department of Health has a roster that if you want to hire an interpreter, you just go look for one there. Um, so, so people can just pay $50 and get their names on that roster. However, there's been a push in the last, I'd say, eight to 10 years to really professionalize interpreting. And I think we probably all have st students who have been in the position of helping out a friend or a family member and just, hey, just come interpret for me. So the community interpreter certificate is really what I'm gonna talk about. That's the entry level certificate um, that will help our students understand the, the ethical guidelines of being a professional interpreter. Um, and also a lot of really just how to be professional about it. So that's what we teach. Um, you can also then from there, become a medical interpreter, which I think would be the next step up with not too much more training. Um, although if you wanna get your national certification, so notice that there's a certificate that we offer after the 40 hour training. Um, but if you wanna get your national certification, that requires a lot more training. And then a court interpreter, there's national and state certification. That's the most difficult to get. Um, however, a community interpreter will also work in medical settings, and there also may be some overlap into the justice system. Um, community interpreters may work with people who are working with social workers or police officers, all kinds of social service areas. Um, so there is some overlap, and that is taught in the community interpreter class. All of these links, everything that you see that's underlined is linked in this presentation. So when you go to the folder, you'll see all the, diff all the information about how to do all of this. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, I'll get more into the 40 hour certificate. Um, so if you look on the left there, it's hard for me not to be able to point. <laughs> I wanna do something with my hands so much right now. Um, so a community interpreter is someone who works in medical, educational and social services settings. Um, and so the steps to get the credential, the certificate would be, you have to be 18, you have to have a high school diploma. You have to demonstrate your bilingualism and literacy through language and proficiency testing. That's something that I think if I were to move forward and do this again, I would probably add this to my class. Um, what I found is that people who hire um, interpreters, a lot of them will do their own testing so when I spoke with people in Winona, for example, who would be hiring an interpreter, they'll require that the person do an interview with them to demonstrate their bilingualism. 
Um, however, other programs like Mankato, who I learned a lot from when I've, has, I've been learning how to do this, um, set their students up to do the oral proficiency interview. So that can be done online. Again, that's also linked um, in the chat or not in the chat on the, on the um, slides. Um, or you could do a serve, use a service to do that, like Weaving Cultures, who is doing our 40 hour training. Um, so the certificate is a 40 hour um, certificate. You have to pass the exam at the end in order to get your certificate. I hope that makes sense. Um, would you like to go to the next slide, please? So um, the bridge programming, what we're doing is a 30 hour bridge course. Um, the 40 hour training must be done by someone who is certified by the Community Interpreter International. The thing that's challenging, and it, if a program could get their own cert, like certified instructor, that would be amazing. It costs about, I think, $3,000. Again, the links are all there. Um, but it, it costs like $3,000. You have to have experience as an interpreter, experience as an adult educator, and be a certified teacher. That's a pretty hard person to find. So we have been partnering with Weaving Cultures, who's in Monticello, Minnesota. Is that how you say Monticello? I don't know Minnesota very well. I'm a Wisconsin girl. Um, they charge 600 a student. Um, the textbook is 120. And then the workbook is an additional 60. So it's expensive. Um, but it's, I think it's worth it. Um, so the bridge course goes through the textbook and does the training at a slower level. It's very high level reading. Um, and so we go through the entire textbook so that students have a chance to become familiar with it um, before they do the 40 hour training. For the bridge class that I talked, that I taught at Hopkins, they asked students to have a, a life and work reading 211B. Um, uh, for Southeast ABE, we're going all the way up to reading level five because it's our pilot. Um, and so we're going to start with our higher level learners. I have to say that the students at Hopkins were incredible. They were wonderful. We had a little rocky start, but really by the time we finished, they're now doing their 40 hour training with weaving cultures and they did great at that level. So when they pass their test, they will be given one of the one of the qualifications that you see on the left there. Level one is qualified. Level two is professionally trained. Level three is hospitality. And then at a minimum, they would need eight more hours of medical terminology training to become to get a certificate to be a medical interpreter. Um, would you like to go to the next slide? I feel like I'm talking too much already. Um, so the first question that I get when I teach this class is what if my language skills aren't good enough? Um, students are obviously nervous about that. And that's okay, because this is a professional training. We're not teaching you um, how, to, how to necessarily, I think in the 40 hour training they do, but in my uh, course, we talk about the profession. It's really about the profession of being an interpreter. So my SSLOs are basically the five things that you see on the screen there. Um, my goals for the class that my learning objectives are reading, using a reference text, going through the textbook, but also there's a lot on understanding the procedures of interpreting, how you position yourself, how, how you do a professional introduction, how you educate people about how to work with an interpreter. Um, and then understanding and applying the ethical principles. There's a lot on that. Uh, there's a lot of what would you do in this situation? We had a lot of really interesting debates in class about what we would do and how you apply ethical principles. Um, and then understanding the profession and whether you want to, do you want to work for an ISP or an LSP, um, a language service provider or an interpreting service provider? Do you want to be a freelancer, uh, making a career plan, things like that? All the soft skills, I think. And then understanding cultural bias and how to be a, a a really qualified professional in this area. So that's what the, um, the bridge course covers. And then I think when they do the training, they go, they use the workbook with the trainer and go through very specific role plays and activities to apply that. Um, all right, I have no idea how long I've been talking, but um, so in terms of the changes, um, like I said, there's a push to professionalize interpreting. In the future, I could very well see that the state, that the legislature will re 
um, increase their requirements. Right now they have guidance, but they do not require things. And again, there's a legislative report you can take a look at. I think in 2015, in terms of medical interpreting, um, the, they, they created the roster that I was talking about earlier. You can put your, pay $50 a year, put your name on as an interpreter, and you can also list your credentials and people will know to find you as an interpreter. They are talking about, but they do not require yet, um, a tiered system so that there will be, you would absolutely would need this, the community interpreter certificate. You would need to document your medical um, training in order to get onto that. However, it's not required yet, but I could see it happening in the future. So I think this is really important programming we can offer our students. Oh, let's see, is the bridge course an ABE course? Is it free? Yes. The bridge course is an ABE course um, and it was free for our students. Yes, um, I'm, I'm not sure what Hopkins did, how they paid for things. Um, at, we're using transitions funding to pay for this for our students. Um, I believe that Mankato did a grant, a P2P grant. I'm not positive, so don't, um, but they were sort of my guiding light as I've learned how to do this. Um, but yes, the students haven't paid anything. This is all paid for by our program. Um, are there any other questions? Well, thank you for listening. And I'm, I'm always available to answer any questions or to go over things with people. Oh, here we go. Oh, excellent question. Um, at Hopkins, I did the bridge course entirely online. Uh, Weaving Cultures is near um, Hopkins, so they are doing a hybrid. So they're doing, for the 40-hour part of the course, um, some is online. It, uh, they can do it completely in person at, at Hopkins, or they can do a hybrid. There are some days that are required. For example, the testing day, they'll be required to do that. And I think they're also going to have an employer panel at the end of it, which is excellent. Um, for Southeast, because we're regional, um, oh, thanks, Michelle. That's so nice. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, because we're regional and we're so spread out, the whole thing is going to be online. So I think Weaving Cultures is open to working with anyone and doing whatever they need. Anything else? Oh, thanks, Lydia. You're so sweet. <laughs> All right, I think it's time to listen to Heather. Thank you, everyone. Oh, how did they handle the scenario portion of the training? That is a really good question. Um, in the bridge course, we had a lot of large group and breakout rooms for scenarios. Um, and then I believe the, the night, I think really it's gonna be a lot of breakout rooms for our class because it will be online. I think it'll be breakout rooms with the teacher popping in to each scenario, coming back for a large group discussion. Um, and I think at, at Hopkins, they'll be able to do it in person. So they'll be able to work together. Thank you, that's a good question. I hope I answered it. Okay, thanks everyone. Heather Turngren with Minneapolis Adult Education, where I am a teacher and a distance learning coordinator. And I also spend some time with Atlas as the coordinator with, uh, for their adult career pathways. I am happy to be here with you all virtually as we learn a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of the Certified Food Protection Manager. So I am going to try to lead you through some information about the Certified Food Protection Manager. That is the certification or the credential that is issued by the State of Minnesota Department of Health. And the State of Minnesota recognizes what they call ANSI, 
approved organizations, which are companies, to earn the certificate. ANSI is the American National Standards Institute, and they verify that these companies and organizations meet the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration's codes for providing food safely to the public. The state of Minnesota has determined there are seven companies or organizations that meet their standards. They're listed here, and I took a screenshot from the state of Minnesota's Health Department website. They're listed in order, but not one is better or not, but they are accredited from ANSI, and they also, as you can see, provide remote proctoring, as many of these companies have moved to fewer face-to-face -face trainings and more online certification trainings. The first one here is the AAA Food Safety. They offer the CFPM. That is all online. So uh, someone would have to pay for their online course. Uh, for many of these companies, the, the fee could range from $70 to $125, and it depends what is included within that course. Some of the courses might have you pay extra for the online exam and then extra for the remote proctoring. So you have to determine what each company requires. The number two is the 360 training company. They have both face-to-face -face or online. However, they are moving more online. What I hear from people who take this training is that the language level is a little bit lower, meaning that it's perhaps easier for non-native English speakers. I have not looked at the material to determine the Lexile level. However, this is what I hear from people who are non-native English speaking and they take that course. Number three is above training or the state food safety company. They are all online and they provide that training and the certification online. Number four is the National Registry of Food Safety Professionals or the NRF, they provide certifications either face-to-face -face from an, an approved and uh, certified instructor or online. I hear from people who are non-native English speakers that, that NRF or the National Registry of Food Safety Professionals can also be a little bit easier test because of the language level. Again, I have not checked it out. I don't have access to those materials. Number five is the National Restaurant Association, and that is what many of us here serve safe. Serve safe is their branded name of their co company and materials. It is not the name of the certificate that's issued from the state of Minnesota. Serve safe spends millions of dollars for all of us to use that language, serve safe, uh, uh, to also teach their materials. They are the number one provider of CFPM around the country. Number six is responsible training or Safeway certifications. That is an all online certification training. Number seven is the Always Food Safe Company. They are actually based out of Minnesota and they provide food safety training across the country. In speaking with uh, the people who work there, they rely upon a lot of video instruction that you can incorporate in your face-to-face -face training, and uh, they also have online training. So you can see there are many different organizations that you could potentially apply to become a certified instructor to offer the certificate training to your students in either an IET or an adult career pathway. So what are the bridge programming or steps to get to the level of the certified food protection manager? So that's the end training that we want. And there are ABE programs in Minnesota that offer food handler as an on-ramp or a bridge course. However, this might not be that industry recognized credential from the state of Minnesota. The state of Minnesota does not issue any sort of food handler credentials. They're all earned when you take the online course. So many of these companies offer the food handler as an entry level and the students might pay uh, six or $25 to take the online course and get the credential. However, that is not what is needed from the Department of Health. 
the Department of Health would like to see the CFPM or the Certified Food Protection Manager, and it supports students who really are employed in food service. So these are people who might have been working in food service for a while, and now they're going to be promoted to become a manager, a supervisor, a coordinator, especially within our um, schools in the nutrition services. A CFPM is needed in locations that serve or prepare food for the public. So any sort of food production facility. We have a lot of those in Minnesota because we're an agriculture state. Also in food service. So in restaurants, you need to have someone on staff who has that CFPM. Hospitals, so in their uh, dining programs, they need to have someone on staff that is CFPM, as well as certified, as well as nursing homes, assisted living facilities, child care providers, food trucks, and so forth. So any place that is providing food to the public would need to have someone on site at all times who has a CFPM. What are the steps to get the credential or certificate? And again, we're looking at the Certified Food Protection Manager Certificate. So the steps are listed here. If you look in the lower left corner, I actually took a, an image of my certificate. So it is not a serve safe certificate. It is this state issued, comes from the Minnesota Department of Health and it is issued and it shows that I am a certified food protection manager. This is the certificate that a health inspector would want to see going into any facility serving food to the public. So what did I do to get this certificate? I had to attend an ANSI approved training course. So one of those seven approved training courses. I have done both face-to-face -face and online training because I want to learn different training techniques or instructing techniques. I passed the approved exam from those different companies to earn the certificate. I mailed in my initial application along with a copy of my successful exam certificate and a check for $35 to the Minnesota Department of Health. I had to do all of that within six months of me passing that initial exam from one of those ANSI approved training courses. It took me about two weeks to get the, to get the certificate that you see here. Um, it is the state issued certificate. It's valid for three years. I have to take a four hour renewal course before the expiration date in order to renew this certificate. That four hour renewal course can be done again at any of the ANSI approved training courses. And that four hour renewal course does not require me to take an exam. So I would just need to have the instructor who is approved by the Department of Health in Minnesota uh, to sign off that I have taken that renewal course. So what changes to the certificate or the process has happened recently and how has that impacted your instruction or course? Again, I'm looking at the Certified Food Protection Manager. The FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, has the food code that regulates food um, codes around the entire country. There were major changes in the beginning of 2019. This included changes with allergens, with uh, bacteria and viruses and temperatures, and all of those changes were science-based changes. In 2023, many of those changes uh, remain the same, but there is more of a focus on allergens and there were more allergens added to the list of known allergens. I would really suggest that you ensure your teaching materials are updated to reflect the food code changes from 2019 as well as 2023. Unfortunately, many of the materials that are listed on the Atlas website do not show those changes. I would encourage you to check with uh, whoever is going to be your certified food protection manager, training provider, one of those seven ANSI recognized companies to get the most up-to-date materials. 
again, many non-native English speakers who have taken either the 360 training and the National Registry of Food Training courses have said that the language level is better for them. Um, I don't know the exact Lexile level, but this is just what they have mentioned to me. And ServeSafe currently requires written permission to use any of their materials for online instruction. So if you are going to do any online teaching, you will have to reach out to the National Restaurant Association to get written permission to use their um, to use any of their branded materials online. I have not been successful with that because they would like students to take and pay for the uh, serve safe materials online. Now, I realize I'm not here to answer any of your questions, but I would like you to be able to reach out to me and I will share my email address at the end of this session so that you could send me any questions that you have and I hope I can find an answer. And I would like to thank you for allowing me to join you all virtually. Have a great session. Heather turned around with Heather turned Slide. There we go. I think we're still seeing Heather's oh. slides. Oh. Amanda, can you swap it back to the other presentation? Oh, things in the chat here. Well, we're I uh, have a moment here of some great sources from Julie and Andrea. Thank you for those. Did you want me to go? This is the last slide. Um, but were we looking to do something different? <laughs> up to you guys. Just want to be sure we had the right thing up. Oh, sure. Um, let's see. Was there anything else? Any other questions or comments? I have a question for Amanda about your curriculum. When you do the paraeducator course, is it a set curriculum that they give you those, those modules, those teaching modules, or is that something that you developed? Yeah. So um, I, and I do want to apologize. Something's wrong with my screen. So I can't see anybody right now. <laughs> so I'm talking to a blank computer, but, um, but I can hear you. So um, yeah, I have been in the process of sort of modifying what that looks like, um, you know, kind of transitioning from the pair pro to the pair educator, um, and sort of weaving in the materials that I used to use with the pair pro, um, with this new robust, uh, para educator curriculum. And so, um, yeah, the long and the short of it is that I sort of mix some of that material. Um, I don't like to just, you know, read all the information that they can also read themselves, um, so I sort of pick and choose the lessons that I think are really good to do in the whole group. Um, and then I assign a lot of that um, to sort of be independent. Um, and then they can work with me one on one as questions arise. So I hope that answers your question, Andrea. It does. Thank you. Yeah, of course. That, that in your online state, uh, this in the state course, you spend a, a couple hours each week. Just mm -hmm. is it just open office hours for students to come in? with questions on those days or do you yeah. are they to be there? Yeah, great question. Um, kind of a mix. So <clears throat> two of the days per week, we do a big whole group class um, and I kind of have a set um, series of, of uh, topics that we go through. So, um, you know, the role of the paraprofessional in the classroom, special education, um, you know, behavior management uh, and even child development. Um, which actually is um, from the child develop, or excuse me, from the para pro days. And thank you to Carlin. Um, a shout out to her for um, helping me with some of that uh, material. Um, but um, the one-on-one -on -one hours, I use 
kind of more or less for test prep for students who are working on various topics um, that might not apply to everybody in the whole group. Um, also, those one-on-one -on -one hours are really useful for students who um, contact us during the middle of the training and they say, hey, I need to take the test like this week or next week, um, and I can get them all up and running um, without sort of having them jump in in the middle of a, a semester. Um, and then, of course, people have other things they're working on, too, like job search and, um, you know, various topics that um, might not apply to the whole group. So that's what I use those for. Thank you. Of course. All right. And I wish I could see everybody, but hopefully um, you guys can see Hi. me. <laughs> Hi, Amanda. This is Julie. And I'm just, I'm going through the chat and Brian Tollison put in there, I'm doing this class. And he's, I believe he's referring, oh, no, this is community interpreter. Okay. And Brian, you say you require a CASA's goals meeting and level five in an interview. Is that something that um, you sit down? I'm just curious, Brian, is that something you sit down with each individual partic participant and meet with them? And is the level five um, the same as what you are using, Andrea? Uh, I'm assuming the level five is the same that we're using at Southeast. Um, okay. It's CASA's goals reading level five is what we're requiring. Oh, okay. All right. But, you know, honestly, everyone knows that, um, you know, a reading level is different than a speaking level. Um, so students, may, but the, the textbook is pretty high level reading stuff. So it, I think it'll work well, but the, the people at Hopkins with a lower level did an amazing job. And I'll, I'll let Brian talk now. Yeah, we don't do necessarily a bridge. Um, the we do a essentially an interview. Uh, I work with a local um, interpreter service uh, as a business as a partner with this, and I'll either talk with the individual or they will meet with them um, and talk with them depending on um, their their primary language. Um, I the, also, uh, I've been real fortunate. I have an in-person instructor that's certified um, to teach that has been outstanding. They will, if they're, somebody is coming from out of area, say for St. Cloud of the Cities, they're able to meet with them. Um, and that's been a real big help in making things successful in teaching the class. We've done it um, twice now. Our last one was just at the end of uh, March. Uh, which went really, really well. Um, but we use CASA's goals as a uh, level five and then also um, that interview in order to, to determine if somebody is really uh, has the language skills necessary to, to meet the to be successful in the class. Okay, thank you. I was just trying to clarify that's uh, that's good to know. Thank you. I also just wanted to kind of push if people are interested in in trying to uh, figure out how to fund offering these types of courses, please do um, consider applying for a Pathways to Prosperity grant. And you can do that as an ABE program. You can do that as a partner with your career force location or other partners as well. And please, I'll put my uh, email in the chat. And if you have any other questions about like the funding portion and how to get these off the ground, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, thanks, Julie. I'm also gonna put um, a plug in in the chat here. We are recruiting for our next advisory team around transitions, adult career pathways, integrated education and training. So if you are someone who would be liked to, like to be involved in, um, at the state level of guiding professional development around these important topics, we hope to hear from you. So there's more information at that article I dropped in the chat. Julie dropped her email. And yeah, thanks for scrolling through that article as well. We'll hang out for just another moment, but I'm just gonna pop the flyer into the chat as well. 
Um, the next session begins at 12.15. You have a bit of a lunch break. I apologize that we don't have a catered lunch for you all today since we didn't get to do that this time, but join us for our fall regionals and metro regional and summer institute and we actually get to dine together. So there's that flyer and we'll see you back here at 12.15. I'll go ahead and close the recording.